AT&T Broadband presents high school basketball. Tonight from Cedar Crest High School, the Falcons play host to the McCaskey Red Tornado. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob McCool. Welcome to tonight's Lancaster Lemon League matchup. Boys, a section one matchup between Cedar Crest and McCaskey. And if you like to watch good athletes in action, ladies and gentlemen, just sit back and enjoy this basketball game because you're going to see some of the best basketball players and the best pure athletes you're going to see anywhere in the Lancaster Lemon League. Perhaps the best athletes you're going to see in all of District 3 on the floor in this basketball game. McCaskey coming in to play tonight, 18 and 1 overall. Cedar Crest, a huge game for the Falcons. They are 11 and 8 overall. Overall and six and four in section one. That record right now has them tied for second place, and that 11 and eight record right now has them in a situation at the 11th spot in the District Three Quad A ranking. So a very big basketball game tonight for the Falcons. As for McCaskey, well, no concerns on their part as far as the playoffs are concerned. 18 and one overall and 10 and 0 in section three. And the reality of it is, for McCaskey, if they can win this basketball game tonight, they will clinch the section one championship. As you see right there. There is the section one standings as they exist coming into play tonight. And along with me behind the microphone tonight, Steve Degler. And Steve, the thing that you've got to talk about first and foremost with this Muskaski team, again, terrific athletes, but they truly understand the team concept of basketball. They have four guys who are averaging 11 points a game, and this is a team that is very talented offensively and defensively. They can play a, varying, uh, a variety of defenses, whether it's half court, whether it's full court, whether it's man, whether it's zone. They can throw everything at you and do it well. Offensively, they can run the floor. If you have to play a half-court game against McCaskey, not a picnic either. They have so many great athletes that can shoot the jump shot. They can get inside. This is a team that is ranked number one in the state right now in Quad A by the Harrisburg Patriot News, and with good reason. This is a great, great basketball team. As Steve said, four guys averaging over 11 points a game, five guys in double figures. All their starting five is in double figures, and that really is a concern because there's not really one player you can key on, but they do have, for most people's money, the best player in the Lancaster 11 league. You can talk all you one about Curtis Waltman, but for most people's money, Jerry Johnson is indeed the best player in this league. He has been playing since he was a freshman and has been in a lot of big games, very poised individual, had 30 in the first meeting against Cedar Crest, and when the Falcons made a run late, this guy just took the game over. He's averaging 19 points a game, could probably average about 30 a game with some other teams in the Lancaster Lebanon League. That's how good he is. He is fearless. He'll shoot with a hand in his face, super quick off the dribble, a tremendous all-around talent. I agree with Bob. He is the best player in the Lancaster Lebanon League this season. And in addition to that, again, a very talented group on the starting five for this McCaskey team and a guy who, although he only scored four points in the first meeting between these two teams, Perry Patterson really is the player in which this whole offense revolves around. And he needs to have a better game defensively too because Eric Carpenter lit him up in the first meeting. But Patterson is a guy who can handle the basketball. He's more like a point forward at six feet five. He's the one guy you can slack off of a little bit in terms of three-point shooting, but inside that arc from 15 to 17 feet he is very dangerous, even though he's big at about 6'5", 225. Not a natural back-to-the-basket, low-post type of player, but he can be dangerous as well. And a lot of the offense runs through him because he does make such good decisions and can pass the basketball. As we said at the moment ago, the McCaskey Red Tornado can clinch the Section 1 championship with a victory tonight. We caught up with Steve Powell, their seventh-year head coach, and talked to him about that matchup, the, the thought about that, and what it's going to take for them to win in a hostile environment here at Cedar Crest. I told the kids that this is always a tough place to play. They're on their home court. It's a big game for them, too, because of where they stand in terms of possibly making the league playoffs and then also with the district playoffs. So they know that they're in a must-win situation, too. So I think that it'll be a, a tough place to play and a, a tough game, but hopefully we'll prevail. And Steve Powell pretty much summed up exactly what's in the mindset right now of Rick Dissinger. This is a tremendous game for Cedar Crest, not only as far as league goes, but district as well. They really can't afford a slip-up down the stretch. This is a game they're not expected to win tonight. Everybody thinks McCaskey's going to run the table. So if they can steal one, they're going to be way ahead of those other people chasing them for the other two playoff berths in Section 1. But they have had their games this year, and they had one last time we were here against Warwick. They had a game at Salenko where they barely won down the stretch, where they just don't play well. They do that tonight. They're looking at a long, long basketball game. Well, the player that hurt McCaskey the most in the first meeting between these two teams was Eric Carpenter. You mentioned a moment ago that he scored 43 points, but depending upon which coach you talk to, a very different opinion as to how those points came about and how much that concerns each one of them. If you talk to Cedarcrest, it came during a run in the fourth quarter as the Falcons were trying to get in the ball game 
game. If you talk to Steve Powell, it was a situation where they were up by 19 points, very comfortable, and Carpenter got 20 of those 43 points in the fourth quarter. But he is going to be a key. He is so athletic that if he can get down the floor ahead of that pressure from McCaskey and Cedar Crest can handle the press, he is going to get a lot of very easy looks inside. They really look for him to do some damage against the 1-3-1 one, one half court trap. They're going to try to drive a ball into the corner and get that ball out of the corner into the low post before the double team arrives. And if they can do that, Carpenter should have a field day. Well, we talk about great athletes. No one in Lebanon County can argue with the fact that the best player, the best athlete in Lebanon County right now is Jaron Hayes, and he has a tremendously important role in this basketball game. He will start defensively on Jerry Johnson. Won't be there the whole game because it takes such a toll chasing this guy around the court for 32 minutes, so they'll move him around a little bit, but Hayes has also been playing very well offensively. His confidence has come back in the outside shot. In the last five games, he is averaging over 20 points a contest. He only had seven in the first meeting, so they're going to look for somebody to help Carpenter, and it could be Hayes, especially in a game that could be up and down at times. With his athleticism in transition, he can get some easy looks. It was 89-75 in the first meeting between these two teams. Rick Dissinger telling us before the basketball game tonight, they've got to keep it in the 60s if, in fact, they're going to come out of here with a victory tonight. Cedar Crest against McCaskey. The Falcons have won four in a row. McCaskey has won 10 in a row. Stick around. It should be a great basketball game. We'll have it for you after this commercial break with the tip and the starters on AT&T Broadband. Coach, a bit of a daunting task tonight with McCaskey on the horizon. What is it that you want from your kids, and how do you how do you sense your kids are thinking about going into this game? Well, what we want is is total and complete effort. Uh, we're a good team too. They're number one in the state, but we've been talking to our kids about being confident. We're we're playing well, and and we're a playoff caliber team as well. So we want to go out, put it on the floor uh, on the defensive end, and I th I think they're ready for that challenge. I think they they sense how important this game can be, how big of a win it would be, but the bottom line is they know they're not supposed to win, uh, but they believe they can. So we're going to ask them to go out, go after it, and uh, hopefully at the end of the night, positive things happen. Rick Dissinger in his second season running the program here for the Cedar Crest Falcons. He's 17 and 24 in those two seasons. Steve Powell in his seventh season at the helm for McCaskey. Let's take a look at the starting lineups for tonight's basketball game. For the visitors on the scoreboard tonight, Jerry Johnson and Anthony Gibson in the backcourt. Johnson at six foot tall, Gibson at 6'2". Forwards, Bobby Eberhardt at 6'2", Dustin Salisbury at 6'3", and it's just a sophomore. And Perry Patterson at 6'5", is the starting center for the Red Tornado. For Cedar Crest, Jaron Hayes, Roger Castle Grand, and Brian Ruiz in the backcourt with Brandon Kirsch and Eric Carpenter inside. And the Red Tornado controls the tap. They come across the half-court stripe in the red uniforms of the white trim. Fred Engel and Jerry Larish are our officials tonight as they'll work it inside to the Red Tornadoes to Patterson, being guarded there by Carpenter. The ball is taken away, steal by Brandon Kirsch. And Cedar Crest in a man-to-man. -man. They put a lot of pressure down at McCaskey. The game was a track meet, 89-75. As Bob mentioned, they want to keep this game in the 60s if at all possible tonight. Ryan Ruiz has it right now on the left wing. He'll take it across, going inside, hard to the hole, no good. Carpenter with a rebound and two points for Eric Carpenter. Carpenter working on the offensive glass against Patterson, and that's an area where he can be key tonight, using that big frame to create some space and one of the big things that Rick Dissinger wants is his, for his team to control tempo here tonight. We saw on the blackboard there during his answer he had a lot of keys to winning. Off to the side of that were ways to control tempo and stop McCaskey from getting in runs. Harry Patterson inside off the mark. Castle Grand with the rebound and a great start so far for the Falcons as Hayes kicks it ahead. Ruiz inside a Carpenter a little bit too tall for Eric Turnover. Falcons. Cedar Crest during the first half wants to have 50 of its possessions end up in the blue area in the paint and that was an attempt right there even though it was a turnover they tried to drive the ball inside and so far they've been successful at least in the approach the first two times they've had the ball the first two shots coming in the blue in the paint area and then they try to dump it down low to carpenter unfortunately they turn it over turnovers even at one apiece but the falcons on top two nothing jerry johnson changes that in a hurry a little too much room given by jaron hayes you can't sag off jerry johnson he is so deadly the other thing is you can't get right in his face he's quick enough to go right around you off the dribble. He's he is not a guy I'd want to guard. He's 40, you won't. 40, 49th three-pointer of the season for Jerry Johnson. The Red Tornado up 3-2. Falcons rolling off the top of the key. Nothing there for Castle Grand. Kicks it back out to Hayes. As Steve said in the open, Jaron Hayes with a red-hot hand, averaging over 20 points a game for his last five. He looks to penetrate inside. Kicks it out. Ruiz for three. Good. 
Brian Ruiz, one of several Falcons tending to some sore ankles, but that one didn't bother him. It's a 5-3 basketball game. Oh, but man. that changes in a hurry with Jerry Johnson. He's got range as soon as he comes out of the locker room. Right away, the Falcons come back the other end. Nothing there on the offensive end. The offensive rebound comes back out to Castle Grant and a fresh look for Cedarcrest. And Johnson right now in the face of Jaron Hayes. Ryan Ruiz rubbing off a screen at the top of the key. He'll give it up for Castle Grand. Having long possessions is one way to keep McCaskey from getting in a running game. Hayes puts up the three well off the mark. Kirsch with the offensive put back. Nice job by Brandon Kirsch and a wild shot by Hayes. Another one of the great athletes on the floor is Brandon Kirsch. And he's a guy that they would like to contribute here tonight. Carpenter's going to get called for his first personal foul as he tries to reach in and take it away from Perry Patterson. Two guys have had a pretty good Lancaster Lemon League football season. Perry Patterson, the starting quarterback for this Red Tornado team. I think how this game officiate is officiated is a huge key for both these teams. McCaskey, if it's allowed to clutch and grab a little bit, slap at the basketball, has a huge advantage. They're not as deep, though. So if the game is called tightly and they get into foul trouble, that could really help Cedarcrest. Patterson has it right now on the right wing, gives it up out front to Bobby Aberhart, working it around. Salisbury pulls up from 15 feet off the mark. One shot and done for the Red Tornado. Cedarcrest has done a good job thus far on the glass at both ends of the floor. Jaron Hayes with the rebound, now taking it to the other end. Kind of go, try to go end to end. Scoop shot, no good. Gets his own rebound and starts it all over again for the Falcons. We'll try to dump it down low inside this time to Carpenter. Carpenter backing up Patterson. First shot, no good. Gets his own rebound. Reverse layup, second one, no good. Trying again for a third. This time he's off the mark, but he's foul. It's okay. He's working hard inside. Yeah, he missed a couple of opportunities, but he stayed with them using that size and that strength, and he draws a foul on Gibson. His first, Steve Powell looks on, realizing he needs to get some rebounding. And that's one of the things with a team like McCaskey that likes to get off the, off the glass and run in a hurry. You can get some opportunities if you stay in there and battle on the boards. They're looking to run the floor and might have an opportunity, and this time the inbounds pass is taken away by Salisbury. Got to use bounce passes against this team. They are so big and so quick. You've got to go around them. Patterson going hard to the hole and scores and is fouled. They're going to call the foul on Carpenter, who draw, tried to draw the offensive foul and didn't. Well, Cedarcrest is in some early trouble now with Carpenter. The two personal fouls, he looked like he was planted and just waiting for Patterson. We'll take a look from a low angle along the baseline. Carpenter maybe sliding to his right just a little bit. And that's why he was called for the personal foul. So Patterson at the foul line to try to complete the three-point play. As he put up the foul shot, they start to buzz in a substitute for the Falcons. But Rick Dissinger is really hoping Patterson makes this shot so he can get Carpenter out of the game. He does indeed complete the three-point play, and that will allow them to bring Tom Kuhn into the basketball game. Kuhn's six foot five, but obviously not the physical presence in the low post as Eric Carpenter. And here comes some full court man. McCaskey plays everything. They'll play full court man, 2-2-1, two, 1-3-1 two, one, 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 half court trap. They'll play a 3-2 zone. You name it, Rick Dissinger has said he has seen it all this year. They don't necessarily play it all in the same game. They may just pick a defense one night and go with it. 94 feet of basketball is the way the Red Tornado like to play it. They lead it 9-7. This is a real test for Cedarcrest now through the end of this quarter with Carpenter on the bench with those two personal fouls. And see if Rick Dissinger gambles and brings him on to start the second quarter. Ruiz has some trouble with it as Dustin Salisbury knocked it away from him momentarily. Salisbury had transfers and they played last year as a freshman at Lampeter Stroudsburg High School and he has become the missing link in this starting five. Thomas Jordan will now check in. Brian Ruiz will come out. Jordan will inbound it to Castle Grand, free for three, off the mark, and Salisbury has the rebound. Red Tornado looking to push it ahead. They push it ahead to Bobby Eberhardt, gives it back to the trail man as Anthony Gibson penetrates and scores. Well, that's part of what you were talking about, how balanced and unselfish this team is. Castle Grand back the other way. The Falcons scoring in a hurry as Castle Grand gets his first field goal. It's an 11-9 basketball game. Well, right now it's a very high-paced game, one that is not going to finish in the 60s if this continues. Salisbury has it right now at the top of the key. Taken away, good hands by Brandon Kirsch. Like he was taking a snap from center right there. Ball was right there in front of him, and he grabbed it. Two turnovers for McCaskey, both of them steals from Brandon Kirsch. Johnson right in the face of Jaron Hayes. Hayes able to get by him with the left hand, but the shot is blocked by Patterson. A 
ahead of the pack and a great behind the back pass and Johnson finishes off but it was Anthony Gibson that made the play. I don't know if Gibson was throwing for Johnson. He saw there were red jerseys to his left and wrapped it around the back and an easy layup. Thomas Jordan for three and it's good. Long range jumper for Thomas Jordan, his fourth of the season and it's a 13-12 game. Johnson pulling up off the stop, nothing but net. What a great touch for Jerry Johnson. He's got 10 already. He hasn't hit the rim at all. Four for four from the field. He hits the rim, it's by accident, that's for sure. He is a pure, pure shooter. Thomas Jordan looks to penetrate, dumping it off inside. Coon can't handle the pass, taken away, and here come the Red Tornado. Bobby Eberhardt ahead of the pack, misses the shot. Good defense from behind by Brandon Kier. Excellent hustle from behind by Kier to contest that shot and force the miss. 15-12, McCaskey on top, 2.13 to go first quarter. Finally, a little bit of a breather here in this half court set for the Falcons. Don't blink, don't blink, you're gonna miss something. Castle Grant has it now to Hayes at the top of the key. Jaron pulls up, has his shot partially blocked by Johnson, and Johnson gets ahead of the pack, and he will finish for two. He hit the rim there with his hand. <laughs> and a timeout will be called by Rick Dissinger and the, the Falcons. With 1.54 to go, first quarter, full timeout for Cedarcrest, 17-12, McCaskey on top. Rick Dissinger breaking his huddle. It was only a 30-second timeout for the Falcons. That's simply a matter of just trying to change the direction of this basketball game momentarily. That was one of the things he had in this chalkboard. How to stop a run was to call a timeout. That's the last resort. He really wants his team to get to the foul line a lot as well, to slow the pace down. And you do that by having Carpenter in the game, but he is saddled with foul trouble right now, and they're going to have to go at least the rest of the first quarter without him. 150 to go in the first quarter. 17-12, McCaskey. Thomas Jordan hard to the hole. Tried to draw the foul. Contact, nothing called. Patterson comes away with the basketball. It's three of the last four times. They have forced a shot off the dribble, off off balance and have not converted. They're, the staff is trying to say, fellas, calm down a little bit, run the offense and get some good looks. Larry Patterson helps them out by turning it over unforced that time on the turnover for the Red Tornado, their third of the basketball game. Here's the 2-2-1, first time we've seen that and no problem for Cedar Crest. Thomas Kuhn will work to help out. Salisbury puts the shot by Thomas Jordan into the scorer's table. He's a tremendous talent. Transfer after his freshman year at Lampeter Strasburg where he averaged in double figures and literally out of nowhere here, he knows Jordan's measuring up that shot and just swats it to the scorer's table. 17-12, McCaskey on top, Cedar Crest with the basketball. Big possession coming up right now for the Falcons, Jaron Hayes. Giving it up to Castle Grand, spotting up for the three, good. Well, they're really shooting the ball well here in the first quarter. Last time we were here against Warwick, they couldn't buy a three-pointer, missed 20 in that game. But here in the first quarter, they've hit three from beyond the arc. Keeping themselves in the basketball game at 17-15 right now. We're in Tornado on top and with possession. Patterson looking at the backdoor cut, hit Thomas Jordan, and set. Johnson runs it down to Salisbury. Salisbury keeping it alive, taps it home. How about that, a double tip by Salisbury. That's how quick he was off the floor to get that second tip. Can't dribble through that double team. And Salisbury took it away, giving it up. Great unselfish play for the Red Tornado, but they miss a couple of shots. Salisbury again taps it home. Got to pass the ball against the 2-2-1. Everhart and Gibson had some trouble with it, but Salisbury able to finish it off inside. It's a 21-15 basketball game. That quickly, the Red Tornado changed the momentum around. It was a two-point game. It's now a six-point game with 20 seconds to go first quarter. Now they create so much offense from their defense. Hayes right now looking to get by Johnson. Gets by one. Pump fake up in the air. Misses the shot. Salisbury gets the rebound with seven seconds to go. The Red Tornado come back three on two. Johnson inside on the great look. And again, they miss it inside. Gibson missed the easy one. And that will do it for the first quarter. At the end of one, it's McCaskey 21 to Cedarcrest 15. We'll take a break and go back with second quarter action after this on AT&T Broadband. Jerry Johnson with a huge first quarter and the McCaskey Red Tornado on top of Cedarcrest at the end of one, 21-15. Johnson with 12 points in that first quarter and a big part of the reason why they are 53% from the field. He's five for five. And I think all eight of those misses for McCaskey were layoff. Brandon Kears has his shot blocked this time by Bobby Eberhardt. Right back comes Johnson pulling up for the foul line, hit the back of the iron. Kears tapped it right back to Johnson. One more effort and two. Jerry Johnson now with 14 points. He's almost at his average already. We're in the first minute of the second quarter. 
again. He averages 19 points a game, but that's partly due to the unselfish play of Jerry Johnson. When he needs to, he can light it up. He scored 31 in a huge victory early on in the season against Chester. Chester then ranked number one in the state, and here's a steal by Eberhardt. Eberhardt ahead of the pack, slams it all. Bobby Eberhardt's first field goal is in style, and again, Dissinger, Rick Dissinger up off the bench, and the Falcons will pull another 30-second timeout. Well, the problem right now, first of all, is the good defense by McCaskey, but Cedarcrest does not appear to be doing anything in its offensive scheme of things. They look very unorganized at this point, and McCaskey taking great advantage of it. That ball, too, contesting it for Cedar Crest. They just tip it. They don't grab it. Then Johnson finishes up for his 14th point of the night, and then Everhart in transition after another turnover for an easy two. And that really is the problem because the game plan going into tonight's basketball game was to get everything into the blue, into the low post at every possession, and that was centered around Eric Carpenter. But with two quick fouls, he had to come out of the basketball game. After the timeout, he's back in. And he's got to be very careful, especially going after the offensive glass. He loves to take charges. You almost can't take that chance right now because it's a 50-50 call. You might get the charge, but you might get your third personal as well. Brandon Kirsch now taking the ball across half court for the Falcons as Carpenter creeps his way out towards the high post, elbow of the foul line for the high post screen. Instead, Castlegrand goes the other way, kicks it back outside to Thomas Jordan. Jordan will now kick it back outside Nick Brightbill into the basketball game for the Falcons. I don't want to say Cedar Crest is unorganized, but I think they're being made to look that way by this McCaskey defense. They just contest everything. They get in your head in a hurry as the ball gets through the legs of Eric Carpenter, turnover Falcons. Anticipating the quickness, or perhaps over-anticipating the quickness, it can cause you some turnovers, and that's what's going on right now for the Falcons. Looking at Carpenter trying to get position against Patterson, fronting him this time, and as Eric is backing up, that pass bounces right through him. Tough one to handle, and a turnover for Cedar Crest, the Falcons' sixth. Jaron Hayes checks back into the game as Perry Patterson goes right by Eric Carpenter for two. It's good coaching. Patterson's quick enough to go around Carpenter, and Carpenter has to let him go. So why not give him the ball, isolate him up top, and let him do his thing? Again, he plays really a point forward position at the top of the key, the quarterback in the football team, and he plays a lot like that at the top of the key. This time, Salisbury blocks the shot at Carpenter. Third block of the basketball game for Dustin Salisbury. Back comes the Red Tornado. Johnson working his magic, gives it up instead. They'll work it around. Salisbury now looks to penetrate. Season opening and score. Got away with a walk. What a great quick move by Salisbury. I was anxious to see him, and he is not disappointed. 12-point run for the Red Tornado. Carpenter can't change it as Patterson gets the rebound, and Kirsch knocks away the loose basketball and comes away with it. Brandon needs some help, finds it in Jaron Hayes. Cedar Crest really needs to settle down, and they're going to be out of this game by halftime. Down by 14 right now with five and a half to go in the second period. Again, the Tornado on a 12-point run. Hayes with it right now, looking to rub off a screen, nothing there. Pulls up, instead will look inside to Carpenter, taken away, Patterson knocked it loose. Three straight turnovers for the Falcons on the offensive end. Gary Johnson now being guarded by Thomas Jordan. Yeoman's work for the sophomore in, jo in Jordan. Johnson pulls up at the foul line too. Hey, Jordan did a nice job. He kept Johnson in front of him, made him change direction, turn him a little bit. Johnson just made a great shot. Make it another turnover as Patterson got back and took away the long pass. They feed him back the other way and Kears fouled him. Johnson feeds it to Patterson. Patterson will go to the line. Well, you're seeing right now why this McCaskey team is ranked number one in the state. They are doing everything. Turnovers, block shots, rebounding, getting in transition, running their offense. They're ranked only behind Harrisburg in the District 3 seedings in the power rankings because Harrisburg does not have a PIAA loss this year. McCaskey's only loss coming in its tournament championship game over Christmas to Parkland. And I, I watched Parkland on the PCN game Saturday, Bob, against Pocono Mountain, and I have no idea how they beat McCaskey. And we talked with Steve Powell before the basketball game, and he's happy that they lost. In reality, that, that's the best thing, and his kids know it. It's the best thing that could have happened to them, that they basically didn't come out and play hard from the outset. Parkland knocked them off, and really, by giving them that loss, it refocused his basketball team in a hurry, and they've won nine straight. Parkland actually hit a three-pointer with 1.7 seconds left to win 62 to 59. Kirsch has himself in trouble on the baseline. He'll get called for the turnover. That's five turnovers in this quarter for Cedarcrest, and they have not yet scored a point. 
And meanwhile, McCaskey's converting every time down against those turnovers. A 10-0 start to this second quarter, and the run overall is 16 in a row. Laquan Lee, six-foot junior into the basketball game, along with John Cameron, 5'9", junior in for McCaskey. First substitutions off the bench for the Red Tornado. If there's a weak link, it is that. You want to try to get into their bench, but that starting five is awful good. Patterson right now with the basketball, trying to get by Carpenter. Carpenter took it away from him. Three on two with Eric Carpenter leading the way. Carpenter puts it up in a hurry. Offensive foul, turnover, and three personals for Carpenter. That the worst thing that could happen right now to Rick Dissinger and the Cedar Crest Falcons. Carpenter in transition. That's an area where you just have to pull up. Stop at the foul line. Take stock of what you have. And he just kept on going. Threw up a wild shot that had no chance to win and commits the personal foul to boot. And a heap of trouble now for the Cedar Crest Falcons. We talked about this with Rick Dissinger before the basketball game. This is a Cedar Crest team that relies on its athleticism and wanting to make the great play as Johnson misses the three-point shot. And that's exactly what Carpenter did right now. Tried to make the great play, and it was not the smart play. Johnson back the other way with a double pump and scores. 18 points now for Johnson. The lead is 20. You put him on garden spot without Curtis Waltman, he's going to average 36 points a game easily. No question about it. That's how good a player he is. Ryan Ruiz right now dribbling it around for Cedar Crest. Gets it outside. Jaron Hayes puts up the long range three. The shot is off the mark. And here comes McCaskey back the other way with Everhart giving it up to Johnson. Hayes now guarding Jerry Johnson. Johnson pulls up for three off the mark. And Kirsch has the rebound. Brandon Kirsch trying to get it ahead of the pack. Great catch by Jaron Hayes and he's fouled. Foul is going to be called on John Cameron. Well, Bob, I guarantee as we watch this replay of Hayes just getting tangled up with Cameron. If I guarded Jerry Johnson, he wouldn't get 40. That's a guarantee. He'd get 60. <laughs> They'd just take him out laughing after 40. Joseph Weissach checks into the basketball game for McCaskey, following the foul on John Cameron. Only the second team foul against the Red Tornado. Again, one of the hopes for Cedar Crest coming into this basketball game was to get McCaskey into foul trouble. That has not been an issue. Hayes looking to make something happen, kicks it off to Castlegrand, pulls up for two, and he's fouled. So this will be another one on Cameron, contesting the jumper. But we asked Rick Dissinger before the game about his team's mindset coming in, and you know, sometimes you're in a situation where you're you're expected to lose, and you actually benefit from that because you think, okay, nobody expects us to do anything. We're going to go out and play and have some fun. But he kind of sensed they were a little tight tonight, and this is a new experience for these players and basically the Cedar Crest program trying to get to the postseason. And it's a huge game on their home court, and. They almost look like they're playing with too much confidence right now. They're trying to make some impossible shots. Roger Castlegrand at the foul line for Cedar Crest goes one for two, and that is the first point of the basketball game, or first point of the second quarter for the Falcons. It's a 35-16 game, and that ends a 18-point McCaskey run. Pass inside across the paint. Weissock couldn't hold it, but it goes right into the hands of John Cameron with two and a half left to go in the second quarter. The other side of that, Bob, is there's a fine line between playing with too much confidence and panic, and it could be the other thing. They maybe panic a little bit here in the second quarter as McCassie got in that big run. Anthony Gibson putting up the three, good. Anthony Gibson's 21st three of the year. It's a 38-16 game. Confidence not a problem for McCaskey. Castlegrand for three, good. Roger Castlegrand's second three of the night. Cuts the lead in half now at 38-19. You want to try to somehow crawl to within about 15 before halftime, if at all possible. Normally you want to get to 10, but that's not going to happen. Inside of two minutes to go, and the Red Tornado turn it over right now as Cameron throws it out of bounds. Gasky pulling back a bit on the pressure defense with Gibson guarding Jaron Hayes in the backcourt, and that's it. No double teams at this point in time from McCaskey. Ryan Ruiz, open for the three, didn't take it. Instead, he'll give it up to Jaron Hayes. He'll pull up for three-point range, off the back iron. Rebound for Naquan Lee. Hayes has been shooting the ball so well. He had been on a three-point run. 
but right now he just can't get one to fall. Has not scored in this basketball game. Again, he had been averaging over 20 a game for his last five. 17 threes in the last five games. Salisbury looking across the lane into Quan Lee. Can't handle the basketball out of bounds. Turnover again for the Red Tornado with 1.16 to go second quarter. Is this Salisbury kid a player or what? Just a sophomore, a lot of controversy about him leaving LS to come to McCaskey this season, but what, what a talent he is at both ends of the floor. Again, he really has become the missing link in this starting five, this unit of five players in double figures for McCaskey. Hayes looking to go inside, has a shot blocked by Weissach, but fouled, and that will send Jaron Hayes to the line. Well, finally, Cedar Crest will get a couple more opportunities at the line as he took it right to Weissach. And the personal foul will send Hayes to the line for two. I would say that Rick Dissinger wanted more than four free throws attempted in the first half. Darren Hayes struggles at the foul line, continue his struggles tonight, continue as well as he misses the first of two. Jerry Johnson will check back into the game. Perry Patterson will also check back into the game with 103 to go second quarter. Darren Hayes at the foul line, still can't find his first point. Patterson has the rebound. And here comes Anthony Gibson across half court. We'll give it to Johnson with 55 seconds to go. Johnson directing traffic. He's right now in his shooting range at about 35 feet away from the basket. He's in the gym. He's open. Patterson spinning away. Nothing there. Instead, they work it around. Good luck inside from Gibson to Daquan Lee for his first two points of the basketball game. But the pass from Patterson to Gibson is what set it up. Gibson's touch pass giving it to Naquan Lee for a 40 to 19 lead in favor of the Red Tornado. If you're Cedarcrest now, you want to end this half on a positive note, try to build something going into halftime, regroup and make a run in that third quarter. 31 seconds to go in the period. Brian Ruiz rubbing off the screen at the elbow of the foul line, off the back iron, gets his own rebound, trying to work it inside. Ball's loose on the floor, Naquan Lee comes away with it. A two on one, Salisbury, and he's fouled. And the foul by Castlegrand preventing the dunk by Salisbury. Good foul by Castlegrand. Don't want to give up the easy two. Send him to the line. Here is Salisbury and had the ball knocked away. And a nice job by Castlegrand. Caskey fans arguing for a intentional foul, but Castlegrand did come across the arm with a, with one hand. It was a clean foul by Roger, his first personal. Sending Salisbury to the line for the first time tonight, 63% on the season. Gets the friendly touch. He's now got seven points in the basketball game, averaging 11.1 on the season. McCaskey four for four from the line, 65% in the season. Not great, but they're not missing anything tonight. It's a 42-19 basketball game now. The Red Tornado on top, down to 15 seconds to go in the first half. Hayes trying to make something happen on the offensive end, gives it up instead of Nick Wrightville. His baseline jumper is off the mark with seven seconds to go. Here comes Jerry Johnson. Down to four, down to three, looks inside. Two, the shot by Gibson, no good, but he's fouled. He'll go to the line with .6 seconds to go. Great diagonal pass by Jerry Johnson. Drives to the right, the defense will go with him, and then boom, back to the left with that diagonal to the block, and Gibson will go to the line. He's one of three seniors being heavily recruited. Johnson obviously is a division one player if he wants to be, and Gibson and Everhart, the Pennsylvania State Athletic Conference schools, Lock Haven, Kutztown after both of them, some of the Division Three schools in the area. There's just so much talent to pick from in this McCaskey team. Gibson at the foul line goes one for two. Patterson almost tapped it home, but the shot is no good. That will do it for the first half. At the end of two periods, it's McCaskey 43, Cedarcrest 19. We'll take a break and we'll come back with halftime here at Cedarcrest High School after this on AT&T Broadband. Welcome back to the cage here at Cedar Crest High School where the Falcons right now are in serious trouble as the McCaskey Red Tornado are on top of Cedar Crest in Section 1 of the Lancaster Lebanon League. The score right now at the break, McCaskey 43, Cedar Crest 19. And we talked about it at the open, Steve, that there were a lot of things that Rick Dissinger wanted to see his team do tonight in order for them to come out of here with a victory. They did it for about the first two or three possessions, and the game changed in a hurry. And maybe that was part of the problem. They came out here and got in a shooting match with McCaskey early on. There were five straight scores that changed the lead up and down action and all of a sudden it looked like Cedar Crest felt 
anything I put up there is going to go in. They took some really wild shots that weren't on the floor of the offense, and then when they lost Eric Carpenter to personal fouls with two in the first quarter and another one early in the second quarter, that really broke down the whole game plan. He was such a big force, literally, in the first meeting with 43 points. Here at halftime, he has three fouls, two points, and three rebounds. And I got to think that that's one of the things that Steve Powell talked about with his team before this basketball game. He certainly, he's always trying to find something that's going to challenge this basketball team. It's so talented. They know very well that they are far and away the best team in the Lancaster 11 League, and they're considerably looking for talent, and, or excuse me, for, for challenges on, an, on a given night with a four-game lead with only four games remaining. And I was assume that one of the challenges tonight was to see if they can take Eric Carpenter out of this basketball game if he put 43 up against him the last time. Even though they won that game by 14 down at their place against Cedar Crest, I guarantee you he wasn't happy that anybody scored 43 points against the McCaskey team. And I asked him kind of a two-pronged question before the game with how good his team is. How does he keep them from just going out there and relaxing and not having an off night? And he goes, well, sometimes we do really struggle when we have a big lead. We don't play well. We don't rebound. We don't play defense. But then I said, how confident are your kids when they walk out there in the court? He said, oh, we're confident every night. And they know how good they are. And it's just sometimes kids are kids. They don't play with that maximum effort. They kind of put it on cruise control. And when that happens, teams kind of sneak back into a game like Cedar Crest maybe did in the first meeting. And then Jerry Johnson lowers the boom, takes over a basketball game difference tonight is he did that from the opening tip with 18 points here in the first half. And really he changed it in a hurry and this is one of the things that we talked about with Rick Dissinger before the basketball game. This kid really does. When you talk about ice water in the veins. He has it. He has that knack to say okay we're in trouble. I need to make a shot here. And he did it not so much tonight with the 18 points. Yet. He did it with his first two shots because again Cedar Crest got the early lead and they did what they had to do in the first two possessions. Jerry Johnson came down. One three and then another three. The second one was from about 25 feet out. And he is incredible. When you need to have a big shot made he is the guy you want taking it. As I said, averaging 19 points a game, put him on another team, he's maybe closer to 30, maybe even over 30. Tremendous talent, but you also saw in the first half that he doesn't force his shots. Maybe one or two here in the course of 16 minutes, but he really gets the rest of the team involved. He's a great passer, handles the basketball. He just does everything well offensively for this McCaskey team, and we saw just a snippet of it in the first 16 minutes here tonight. He can do a little bit of everything, and, and this McCaskey team also can do a little bit of everything on the floor, and that's really one of the things that you, you see about this, and one of the things I appreciate about a good basketball team is a team that knows that they've got you on the ropes, and they came out in that second quarter with a six-point lead, and they went right for the jugular and turned this game completely in their favor. Ran off a big run. They really picked up the defensive intensity a little bit. 11 first-half turner turnovers for Cedar Crest, and they just kind of forced Cedar Crest into those turnovers. The defense came out a little more, a little more, was tough on the ball handler, challenged the next pass, and they were able to convert those turnovers into a lot of immediate points. We saw Everhart with the dunk, and that's just the type of team they are. You give them that challenge, you say, okay, let's go out and try and accomplish this tonight, and more times than not, they're going to go out there, and they are going to have a big ball game at both ends of the floor. Salisbury there in transition. He has three blocks in the first half. We can go on and on about the exploits of this McCaskey team in the first half. That's how good they are. And I want to see somebody who can beat them in late February and March. Parkland beat them in December. Can somebody beat them in February and March? And, I, and that team's going to be awfully, awfully good. And it's, it's going to certainly have to be a miracle comeback. If, if Cedar Crest is going to do it tonight, again, at halftime, it is the McCaskey Red Tornado 43, Cedar Crest 19. We'll take a break, and we'll come back with the start of the second half after this on AT&T Broadband. Welcome back to Cedar Crest High School. The question of the week this week on lebcohoops.com, who is the Lebanon County Boys Coach of the Year? You've got seven choices for the seven teams in Lebanon County. Log on to lebcohoops.com, find the AT&T broadband banner, and register your vote for who you think is the Lebanon County Boys Basketball Coach of the Year. We'll take a look now at our halftime statistics. Again, Cedar Crest trailing the Red Tornado from McCaskey, 43 to 19. One of the things you won't see, points in the paint, 18 for McCaskey, six for Cedar Crest, and that means that they're just not getting the ball into Eric Carpenter when he's in the game, and the problem is he was not in the game a whole lot in that first half with foul trouble. Great, great discrepancy shooting, 57% to 27%. 
And you look at the rebounds, McCaskey has an advantage there. They forced 11 turnovers. Really not a weakness for McCaskey in that first half. When they play the type of game they do, you're going to have a fairly high number of turnovers. They try to make some impossible passes. They're in transition a lot. When you do that, you will make your mistakes. So eight is really not a high number for them. That was almost a flawless first half for McCaskey. Again, they led this basketball game 17-15 at the end of the first quarter, but one of the runs that Rick Dissinger was so fear afraid of occurred with an 18-point run led in large part by that young man, Jerry Johnson, 18 first-half points. You take a look at our next game coming up here in AT&T Broadband. We'll be at Anvil Cleona High School for a matchup in Section 3 of the Lancaster Level League Boys matchup between Elko and the Dutchman of Anvil Cleona. We'll have that game coming to you live on Channel 23 in Lebanon, Channel 8 and 42 in Elizabethtown at 750. Again, Jerry Johnson, leading scorer at halftime with 18 points. Dustin Salisbury with eight. Perry Patterson with seven. And Anthony Gibson with six to lead the way for McCaskey. For Cedar Crest, Roger Castlegrand, their top scorer with nine first half points. Had a good look at Johnson. He is considering about 10 schools right now, six of them Division I. They go with a lob pass inside, too tall initially, but Patterson there for the offensive putback. And Patterson with nine points in the basketball game. It's a 45 19 game. Right back comes Jaron Hayes, misses, and a foul will be called on the rebound, I believe, against McCaskey. Carpenter's hoping so, because he was right there, and it will be in Patterson. Here's the lob off the first possession. Set play, though, run at halftime. Still went, almost went in, then Patterson on the weak side able to finish it off. And picked up a personal foul at the other end, just his first. So Cedar Crest will inbound under their own basketball, under their own basket, I should say. Castlegrand looking for somebody to rub off a screen. Finally, Ruiz comes loose, nothing there. He'll kick it back out. Kirsch will step inside, looking for Carpenter. Couldn't get the pass off cleanly. Patterson took it away to Johnson, to Everhart off the rim, or off the backboard, I should say, and a foul will be called this time against Cedar Crest. Kirsch had the right idea. McCaskey just closes so quickly that what looked like a short layup ended up being a transition opportunity the other end. Johnson loops it back. Castle Grand got caught underneath Everhart, who will go to the line to shoot two. 73% on the season is Bob Everhart. And he gets his first foul shot of the night. Three points on the night for the 6'2 senior. Everhart averaging 14 and a half points a game. Actually the number two scorer on this McCaskey team behind Jerry Johnson. He now has got four on the night, and it's a 47 to 19 lead for McCaskey. Hayes gives it up to Castlegrand. Castlegrand looks to penetrate. Nothing there. He's in trouble. Finally finds Kirsch to get away from him and avoid the three-second violation. Hayes thought about the three. Instead, it's Ruiz looking to go inside and pass intended for Carpenter, taken away by Patterson. Ahead to Everhart with the slam. A great job just to control that basketball and then soaring through the lane to dunk it home. Steal by Patterson, a tough pass from Perry Patterson, and as Steve said, a great catch and finish by Bobby Everhart. We'll watch it again. It's Patterson again with the long bounce pass, and I can't tell you what that feeling is like, and I mean it. <laughs> but that's a great catch, a tough angle. When you're basically on the same plane going down the floor to try to catch a bounce pass like that on the run with no angle whatsoever is very difficult. It's different if the ball's coming in from the side and you can kind of read it, but that ball was right behind it, and he caught it off to the side then just rose up and slammed it home. Carpenter from the elbow of the foul line off the mark. Good box out inside by Everhart. Here comes the red tornado. Anthony Gibson has it right now. Hayes again guarding Jerry Johnson. Johnson looking to rub off a screen on the baseline. Has it right now. Looks to penetrate on the baseline. Stepped on the end line or was he fouled? He was fouled. That was so quick off the dribble. That will be on Jaron Hayes, his first, team's third. Just a little bump there, forcing him across the baseline. Hayes called for the foul. Let me correct myself, as team foul number two against the Falcons. Johnson, baseline jumper, two. 20 for Jerry Johnson. Set play, he inbounds on one side, then runs to the other side off a baseline screen. They just simply rotate the ball around the perimeter and put two in the book for McCaskey. If you're a shooter, you're gonna find Jerry Johnson now with 20 points on the night. The lead is 32. 51-19. Hayes, nothing there. And that's the other thing you got to say about Jerry Johnson. He has shut down Jaron Hayes tonight. Hayes with 
nothing in the offensive column right now. Jaron trying to make something happen. There's his first two. He was standing right in front of him. He must have heard that. Jaron Hayes again averaging over 20 points a game his last five. Johnson countering on the other side with a long range three off the mark. And a reach in foul will be called against Bobby Everhart in the rebound. Even when he misses, it looks good. <laughs> You've got to assume it's good, if nothing else. Here's Hayes. Doesn't have the jumper going tonight, so he decides to put the ball on the floor. Nice job. Two hands on the take. Gets around Johnson and lays it off the glass for his first points of the night. Foul is on Everhart. His first team foul number two in the second half. No foul difficulties at all for McCaskey. Carpenter playing with three. They get it inside to him, and he scores. Missed assignment there. Herrick was wide open underneath. Good entry pass from the top. Just the second field goal tonight for Eric Carpenter. This is a 51-23 basketball game as we approach the five-minute mark here in the third quarter. Anthony Gibson, pass knocked out of bounds. Good hustle that time on the defensive side by Jaron Hayes. Tough night for Eric. And some of his coaches from Temple University, where he will be going in the fall to play football, are here tonight. I'm sure talking to him and his family, maybe doing a little recruiting some of his football teammates as well. Jaron Hayes this time comes up with a steal on the defensive end. Pulling up at the elbow of the foul line off the mark. Patterson with a great job to tap it to himself. And then finds Johnson ahead of the pack. Off the backboard for Salisbury. A little too cute for McCaskey to turn it over. Castlegrand comes back the other way. Goes behind the back. Carpenter couldn't hold on to it. And the pass is knocked loose right into the hands of Brandon Pierce for two. Does he get an assist for that? Great place, right time, and Brandon Pierce scores. And that's, I think, what Steve Powell was talking about with his team. And you see... Johnson in traffic trying to bank one off the board for a dunk. You get the big lead and sometimes you, you tend to relax a little bit maybe become a little too carefree and something you don't want to do too early in a game that could cost you. He makes up for it in a hurry though. Jeffrey Johnson comes up and pulls up at the elbow of the foul line. Two more for Johnson. 22 in the night. He had 30 in the first meeting and he is on pace to eclipse that tonight. Hayes from three point range comes up short. Patterson has the rebound. Pass ahead. Gibson runs it down, saves it to Eberhardt. They try to tip it out front. Castlegrand knocked it loose. Castlegrand coming down one on one. He scores. He's played pretty well tonight. That's a tough shot with the defense bearing down on him from behind. And he has reached double figures now with 11. So the Red Tornado getting a little bit sloppy in the last minute or two. And it's a 26 point basketball game right now. 53 27. Kasky on top. And a timeout will be called by the Red Tornado. With three minutes, 34 seconds to go, third quarter, 53-27. McCaskey on top, the Red Tornado calling the 30-second timeout. Well, Castle Grand's a gym rat. This is a nice move that he makes off balance. He plays AAU, plays Keystone games in the gym constantly, working out in the summer, and just a sophomore. He's been doing this since fifth or sixth grade, and trying to have a, a big, big career here at Cedarcrest. Steve Powell right now calling that timeout. Again, his team leads it by 26 points. But as we mentioned just a moment ago, he does not like it when his team starts to let up. He likes to keep his team focused at all times on the task at hand. And that is why he calls the timeout. Wing screen by Salisbury. Don't bother with the roll. This guy's just going to pull up to his left off the dribble and bury another jumper. Steve Powell looking very Lou Karnaseka-esque tonight. <laughs> And in the post game, I might ask him for that sweater. See if he'll switch. You won't have trouble finding him in the crowd, that's for sure. I like it. Patterson working inside. Two more for Perry Patterson, who's played strong inside tonight. He's in double figures with 11. Well, that's another thing. You want to play strength? McCaskey can match it. You want to play finesse? They certainly can match you in that category as well. Patterson, a true spectacle on the football field. He's the starting quarterback for this McCaskey team and had a great season as a junior and he will be a Division I prospect on the football field next year. And he's been starting there. It's going to go in. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a shot I believe you could make. <laughs> Jaron Hayes drives hard to the hole and we'll let you watch the rest. You can just see it from our angle here. That ball was going to bounce in. I think I would just give myself the H and go from trying to make sure I don't get the O. <laughs> Jaron Hayes at the foul line, misses again from the strike. Jaron now 0 for 3 from the foul line. He came in at 51%. It's been a season-long struggle for him. Foul, by the way, was on Perry Patterson. Again, Hayes misses it. Kearse running down the loose basketball. Johnson takes it away. 2 on 1 back the other way, but a bad pass that time, but it was kicked out of bounds. Last touched by Cedargrass. It'll stay McCaskey basketball.
frustrating night again tonight for Jaron Hayes, who had been playing with a lot of confidence for the last five games, but right now he's struggling to find the range on the offensive end. Johnson, trouble finding the inbounds pass, and finally it's taken away as Thomas Jordan ends up with it. Jordan will give it to Jaron Hayes. Hayes now being guarded by Dustin Salisbury. Dustin Hayes goes right by him, but it's blocked. Good weak side help that time by Bobby Everhart. And he's got a bigger player on him in Salisbury. Used his quickness to go around him. Salisbury has to play from behind and gets a piece of it for his fourth block of the game. Nick Brightbill, Eric Carpenter, Thomas Jordan, Jaron Hayes, and Brandon Kearse, the five on the floor right now for the Falcons. Brightbill will inbound it, knocked out of bounds again, this time by Jerry Johnson. It's Johnson, Everhart, Gibson, Patterson, and Salisbury, the starting five in there for McCaskey. The other thing for McCaskey, Bob, very little emotion. Even when they make a great play, they just simply get back on defense. They hustle to the other end of the floor. They have to be very impressed with their poise. They are all business as Carpenter this time will go to the back to the foul line, and I believe that's going to be number three on Perry Patterson. So Carpenter will shoot two. Excuse me, has number two on Perry Patterson. Nice pump fake by Carpenter, and that was one of the areas that they felt they could get McCaskey in foul trouble. They are such great shot blockers that they will go for the pump fake, but it never really materialized here tonight. Team foul number four on the Red Tornado as Carpenter to the foul line, 61% on the season, makes the first. Comes up a little flat on the second one, and Salisbury has the rebound. It's 55-28, McCaskey on top. Salisbury has it right now. Looking for some help on trouble on the left-hand side. Gets it down low to Gibson. Look across the paint to Patterson. Nothing there. Good defense by Carpenter. Patterson looking to make something happen. Does it by himself instead. Couldn't find a teammate to pass it to, so he took it to the hole and scored himself. He's got 13, so there's just you can't stop everybody on this team. Jordan dishes it off inside. Carpenter for two. Carpenter now with five in the quarter, seven on the night. I think if you can stop one of them, you got to consider yourself as having a good night. And really the one who hasn't done a whole lot offensively is Everhart. He only has six points. That guy's done a little bit tonight. He's got 24. Jerry Johnson showing he could score inside as well as outside. Right, Bobby Everhart averaging 14 and a half a game. The second leading scorer on the season held so far tonight to just six. Emphasized so far tonight, a minute and a half left to go in the third quarter. And that's the beauty of this team is it doesn't matter. And getting back to your point about the emotion, they just, they come out and there's not a lot of celebrating. There's not a lot of dancing or jumping up and down after they make a great play. They just get back and they get back on defense. I'm anxious to see what they're going to do when this game's over because they wrap up the Section 1 championship. I, I doubt very, very little because that's not necessarily their goal. They have bigger aspirations. Jordan turns it over as he made a pass across the paint. Nobody home for the Falcons. Back comes Salisbury giving it off to Johnson for three more. Jerry Johnson drains it from long range. And it's a 62 to 30 basketball game. Interesting to see how many of these guys play in the fourth quarter and how many minutes they get. Johnson going for the steal against Nick Brightbill will get called for his first personal foul. Johnson, for what it's worth, has 27 points. Here are the power ratings. Again, based on your record and the caliber of competition you play in terms of school size, not in how good or how bad a team is. And it's only PIAA schools that are involved, so Harrisburg's loss is coming in the Keystone Round Ball Classic, and McCaskey, the one loss to Parkland, has them number two right now. Roger Castlegrand from three-point range, Kansas third three of the night. That is 11, excuse me, 14 points for Roger Castlegrand. Can you imagine the atmosphere at Hershey Park Arena if it's McCaskey and Harrisburg in the district final? We witnessed last year's game between McCaskey and Hempfield or excuse me, Harrisburg and McCaskey last year in the semifinal. McCaskey winning that on their way to beating Hemfield for the District 3 Quad A Championship. Well, not everybody in District 3 was on the McCaskey bandwagon last year. Hemfield was still thought to be a force, certainly Harrisburg, and McCaskey may be arriving a year ahead of schedule, and they're on schedule this year. Roger Castlegrand continues to be the bright spot tonight for Cedarcrest as he scores inside and gets fouled. and picking up his second personal foul. Castle Grant to the line to try to complete the three-point play. They only gave Castle Grant two in that last shot, according to the scoreboard. 
You are right, they did. So Castlegrand now with six points in the quarter, 15 on the night as he misses the foul shot. It's a 62-34 basketball. Hey, I agree with you, Bob. I thought it was a three. The Red Tornado turn it over back at the other side as McCaskey right now in one of those streaks where they'll get a little sloppy with the basketball with the final seconds ticking off the third quarter. Jordan to beat the buzzer off the glass, no good. That will do it for three periods of play. It's McCaskey 62 and Cedar Crest 34. We'll come back with the final eight minutes after this on AT&T Broadband. Welcome back to Cedar Crest High School, along with Steve Douglas. My name is Bob McCool. McCaskey and Cedar Crest in a boys matchup in Section 1 of the Lancaster 11 League. It has been all red tornado tonight as Carpenter trying to score inside, comes up short with the baby hook. And Harry Patterson and the red tornado come back the other way. Starting five still out there for the red tornado with a 28-point lead on the scoreboard. And there you see the shooting numbers for McCaskey. Missed one inside as they went with a lob pass. Eberhardt was open, he missed the dunk. Back the other way comes the offensive spark plug for Cedarcrest. That is Roger Castlegrand getting a 17 point, goes to the line in addition. Well, he has scored nearly half their points, and that time he basically waited for the defense to commit and created the foul while making the shot. Salisbury going for the pump fake, and Castlegrand a little lean to his left to create some space and hooked it in while drawing the contact. Castlegrand had six points in that six of the Falcon 15 points in that third quarter. And now starts this fourth quarter with a three-point play. Gives him 18 on the night, and it makes it a 62-37 basketball game. Cedar Crest now just three for 10 from the foul line tonight. Castle Grant's high for the season. His career high for is 28. He is, again, 18 so far in this game. Salisbury looking to penetrate. Nothing there. He'll kick it back out to Patterson. They'll work it around the perimeter. With seven minutes remaining in the basketball game. But neither team showing a whole lot of full court pressure here tonight. McCaskey hasn't shown that 1-3-1 that Rick Dissinger was concerned about. They've gone basically a straight man-to-man. Salisbury missing from long range. Cedarcrest gets the rebound. They're in trouble in the backcourt, but Kuhn and... Right, Bill, get it across half court. Great look inside from Castle Grant. Carpenter couldn't hold on. Salisbury back the other way to Gibson. He's, he is fouled. Excuse me, Bobby Everhart is fouled. He'll go to the line and shoot two. And they are really, really unselfish on the break. Willing to make that extra pass. Castle Grant reaching in, preventing the easy two. Second time he has done that tonight. We'll send Eberhardt back to the foul line. He's two for two on the night, 73% on the season. And he makes another one. That's seven points now for Bobby Eberhardt. And Eberhardt also makes the second. Makes it a 64-37 basketball game. Thomas Jordan battling with Jerry Johnson. Johnson next knocks it away, feeds it ahead, and finishing on the other end. Everhart can't make it happen, but he will again go to the line. But it was Jerry Johnson's defensive play that made it work. A long night there for Rick Dissinger on the Cedar Crest bench, and another beautiful pass. Cross court by Johnson. Jordan with the body contact, sending Everhart to the line for two. Call that on Castle Grand. He did indeed. It should have been Jordan. So Everhart to the line to shoot two more. Continues to stroke it at the line. That's five straight now for Bobby Everhart. Next one would give him double figures at 10. He does indeed get to that 10 point plateau and it is number four on Roger Castlegrand. He can't really say he's not contributing now. Now Johnson again going for a steal against Thomas Jordan, knocks him down, and that will be number three on Johnson. 18 foul, so it's a one and one for Jordan. So Jerry Johnson trying to work his magic on the defensive side right now and coming up with steals. Instead, we'll send Thomas Jordan to the foul line to shoot a one and one. Tom Kuhn and Eric Carpenter inside for the Falcons, along with Castle Grand, Nick Brightville in. Thomas Jordan at the foul line. That's the five on the floor right now for the Falcons. Thomas Jordan with a three-pointer back in the first quarter for Cedar Crest. That's his first point since. Falcons hit three threes in the first quarter. And again, they led this basketball game at one point, seven to six. 
but it changed dramatically at the end of the first quarter. Jordan goes two for two, makes it a 66-39 basketball game in favor of McCaskey. Seventeen fifteen, McCaskey lead at the end of the first quarter turned into a 35-15 McCaskey lead after an 18-point run. Patterson trying to make it happen on the offensive end, and they're going to call Castlegrand, I believe, for the foul. If so, that's Rogers' fifth. Yeah, that's a shame because he's played a great basketball game here tonight. He got the foul that should have been charged to Jordan last time down, and here he tries to draw the charge on Patterson, and he is called for the block, and he'll foul out with a team-high 18 points in this ballgame. So a strong game nonetheless for Roger Castlegrand, one of the few bright spots on the offensive side for the Falcons as he leaves with five personals. And Jaron Hayes will check back into the game. Not a shooting foul for the Red Tornado, so they'll inbound, inbound into their own basket with 5.58 to go in the game. Inbounds pass to Salisbury, misses the first shot. Carpenter comes away with a rebound. Carpenter finding Tom Kuhn ahead of the pack. Kuhn will wait for help, gives it up to Jaron Hayes. Hayes looking for, Cal for Carpenter inside. The shot is blocked by Salisbury. Jump ball, possession arrow favors the Red Tornado. Carpenter was wide open, maybe a little too much air under the pass, allowed the defense to collect itself. And then Salisbury, his fifth blocked shot of the game. And it results in a turnover for the Falcons. And that's the defensive presence of Dustin Salisbury. And again, it's something that he relies on perhaps, uh, perhaps sometimes too much, his ability to just block shots. But with that kind of leaping ability, you can understand why. Dustin Salisbury on the lob from Anthony Gibson. Back the other way, Thomas Jordan puts up the quick shot, no good. Right build back the other way, shot partially blocked that time by Bobby Eberhardt. Patterson ahead of the pack. Salisbury, this time the more conventional two. 70-39, McCaskey on top. Carpenter back the other way, misses the shot, but he's fouled by Salisbury. Okay, they are fun to watch. You don't see many high school teams with the alley-oop in their playbook. Gibson up top, well beyond the arc. That's a tough pass to make. And Salisbury actually catches this ball below rim level and puts it back up and tomahawks it with two hands. Dustin Salisbury with 12 points, and the young man can flat out jump out of the building. And again, that's one of the reasons we talked about this with Steve Powell before the basketball game. He had a tendency when he first got to McCaskey to rely too much on that jumping ability to do all his work on the defensive end. They're working with him. He's just a sophomore, and he's a special player. Some would say he's got an easy job this year. I, I don't think so. I think it can be sometimes tough handling a team with all this ability, and he has a great handle on them. Nobody is selfish. They share the basketball, and as a result, they're on their way to going to 19-1. and one. It's not easy to keep a team as special as this one focused on what they're trying to do and playing as a team. And they do just that. A great pass that time. Gibson with the pass. Joseph Weissach with the finish inside his first field goal. They just keep racking them up. Brightville back the other way, no good. Salisbury has the rebound, and he'll try it again the other way. Laquan Lee can't convert. Hayes hustles back to get the rebound. Now Jaron going to try to do something in the open floor. He feeds it to Carpenter. Carpenter pump fakes twice and finally scores inside. Carpenter is in double figures now with 11, but not the type of game he was hoping to have. I think he wanted 11 in the first quarter to come out there and set the tone, and it just didn't occur tonight. Got those early fouls, and... As a result, McCaskey just exploded. Juan Lee, jo John Cameron, and Joseph Weissach all on the floor right now for McCaskey. Two starters still in the starting lineup, Dustin Salisbury and Anthony Gibson. Again, Patterson just a junior, Salisbury just a sophomore. The other three starters, Johnson, Everhart, Gibson, all seniors for McCaskey. And Steve Powell was telling us his JV team, 16-1. So don't think just because those three are graduating that it's going to be a down year next season for the Red Tornado. We won tonight's JV game by 50 at 78-28. The varsity's trying to do the same at 72-43 right now. And a double dribble will be called that time, checking into the game and making the turnover. Jerry's younger brother, Julius Johnson, turning it over. Julius Johnson, a 
junior, 5'11 junior to be exact, makes the, commits the turnover. And these guys on the McCaskey bench aren't even smiling right now after they came out of the game. It's Brandon, just business as usual for them. Brandon Pierce with the three-pointer. His second field goal of the night, he's got, excuse me, his third field goal, he's got seven points. He's 15 for three of the year. Bob, you think they were 1-19 instead of 19-1, the way they look in the bench right now. And they're about to wrap up a section championship. Business as usual. Said it before, and don't want to beat a dead horse, but that's just the way they do it. They come out, they beat you. They play a lot like Harrisburg did last year at the beginning of the season. Harrisburg eventually it didn't work, and kind of as... Kirk Smallwood told us at the beginning of the season it was kind of a cancer that ate its way through the middle of the basketball team, and that is the only team that's going to stop McCaskey right now. That's the team in the red and black uniforms. McCaskey, the only team is going to beat themselves. And, and it looks like it's very healthy right now. This team, just a, a great, great performance here tonight. I really think sometimes on defense they bait you. They make you think you're open, and all of a sudden here comes Salisbury for a block shot, and here comes Patterson into the passing lane for a steal against a guy that looked like he was open, and they're, they're quick enough to do that. Whether they can continue to do that as you get into district and state play and get away with it, we'll have to wait and see. Thomas Jordan right now with the basketball, giving it up to Brandon Kirsch. Kirsch giving it up to Tom Kuhn, baseline jumper off the mark. Carpenter battling inside. The ball comes in the hands of Ruiz. Nice pass to Brandon Kirsch. He misses, but he's fouled. Lee from behind will commit the personal. There you see the remaining games for Cedarcrest after this one is finished. The Falcons coming into play tonight, tied with Mannheim Township at six and five. Hempfield a game behind, at, at, along with Ephrata at four and four, or excuse me, at five and five and a big three games coming up for Cedarcrest if, in fact, they're going to claim one of those three spots in Section 1. And Rick Dissinger said uh, several times in our pregame conversation that they control their own destiny, and they like that. It's a new experience for the program. They have a tough stretch left, but they're playing the teams that, if they win, if they can go 3-0 to finish the season, they're going to find themselves playing in the Lancaster Lebanon League playoffs. If the teams as bunched as they are right now in Section 1, teams are going to knock each other off. Hempfield playing Mannheim Township tonight, so one of those two teams could very well bump the other from the, the, the basketball playoffs. There is the reigning games on our schedule. Yes, indeed, just three more nights left to go in the Lancaster Lebanon League. Friday night we'll be at Anvil Cleona in Section 3 boys matchup. And then next week as we go down the stretch, some big games, Lancaster Catholic, Lebanon Catholic, and a boys-girls doubleheader. And then we'll finish it up next Thursday night. Again, Lancaster Lebanon League finishing on a Thursday night, February the 8th. And we'll have Lancaster Catholic at Elko in a girls Section 3 matchup that very well could decide the Section 3 championship. Ryan Ruiz, the other side for Cedarcrest. He scores in transition. Ruiz with five points. Makes it a 73 to 50 basketball game. We've still got two minutes, 53 seconds to go in the game. So after tonight, there could be three teams, actually four if Ephrata wins. Four teams at six and five, battling for two playoff spots in section one. It's going to come down to the final couple of games. And again, the district cutoff date is one week from tonight. So after next Tuesday's game, we'll determine the District 3 playoffs. And that is also a goal that the Cedar Crest team has right now, trying to get their way into the Quad A playoffs. So they are definitely going to have to probably win their next two in order to make this field a 16. They will be at Warwick on Friday night, and then they'll finish up their last two games home against Manheim Township and then against Hempfield. Foul will be called against the Falcons, slowing down McCaskey's break. We'll send the Red Tornado to the foul line now to shoot a one and one. Carpenter picking up his fourth personal. They did not play well here against Warwick. The last time we had the Falcons on AT&T Broadband and they will try to turn things around on Friday, which, you know, becomes almost a must win. I mean, there's a lot of basketball to be played in as bunch as the teams are, but you take a loss here tonight, which there are going to be some other losses handed out by McCaskey in the, in the final games, but you don't want to take any chances. They realize they got a second chance despite that loss to Warwick, and they don't want to go into the last week of the season needing help from somebody else. Juan Lee making two foul shots for the Red Tornado. Brandon Kirsch back the other way, puts up the shot in traffic and scores. Kirsch now with seven points in the quarter, 11 on the night. 
77-52 is the score right now. It's all academic as the Red Tornado will move to 19-1 and, and win their 10th straight basketball game. And Cedarcraft's gonna have to try to make something happen in their final three. Brian Ruiz with the off-balance shot, no good. Battle for the basketball, and will go to McCaskey. Jared Mead, Nick Brightbill, and Billy Alisea will all check into the basketball game for Cedarcrest, as Rick Dissinger will clear his bench with 1.34 to go in the game. John Cameron out there right now for the Red Tornado. Long range three-point shot that time off the mark. Shot that time by Cameron Whittington. Back comes Cedarcrest. Alisea gets called for the traveling violation. Things started out great here. These teams trading baskets early on. It was 2-0, 3-2, 5-3, 6-5, 7-6, 9-7. was took things over after that and has not let go. Thomas Jordan with a nice play on the defensive end. As Julius Johnson put up the three, and Thomas Jordan knocks it out of bounds. Interesting to see where Jerry Johnson ends up next year, Bob. He's looking at some Division II, some mid-level Division I, some Weber State, Drake, Indiana State, Ryder. He has a lot of choices ahead of him in the next couple of months. Thomas Jordan pulling up in transition. It's his second three of the night with 50 seconds to go. Makes it a 24-point game again in favor of the Red Tornado. Jerry Johnson is a, certainly a D1 caliber player. He has not yet qualified academically. Cleveland State also in the mix, so it'll be determinant on his, how he does academically as to whether he'll be playing, probably, that would be the determining factor, D1 or D2. Unless he wants to sit out a year as a non or partial qualifier and practice with the team. If he were 6'3", the whole country would know about him. But he's only six foot, considered undersized for big time division one. If he were 6'3", six, 6'4", six, the ACC, the Big East, the Big Ten, the SEC, and the Big 12, they'd all be coming to Lancaster this year. And especially with the caliber of competition that this team has played. McCaskey has backed down from no one. They made the name for themselves. If they didn't, if people didn't know about him around the state, they went to Chester at the beginning of this basketball team and knocked off Chester, who was then number one in the state. And beat that was the difference. Which has John Allen going to Seton Hall next year, the top player in the state. So yeah, very impressive. And that will do it. The final score in the basketball game is McCaskey 81 and Cedar Crest 57. Steve Degler will try and catch up with the head coach for the Red Tornado, Steve Powell, when we come back. Again, the final score, McCaskey goes to 19-1 on the season, and they win the uh, clinch, I should say, the Section 1 championship. Final score, 81-57. Welcome back to Cedar Crest High School. McCaskey winning tonight 81-57, clinching the Section 1 title. Their head coach, Steve Powell, joins me. Congratulations, but I know that's not your ultimate goal to win Section 1 of the Lancaster Lebanon Lake. No, nah, we got a lot of work to do, and we're, we take one game at a time. It's nice to win this section, but now we have to get ready for the league playoffs as well as uh, hopefully the district playoffs and try to do some things there, and we can do some things there. Hopefully we can make the state tournament. Bob and I were talking how impressed we are with the poise, the composure, and the unselfishness of your team. With all that talent, sometimes it can be tough to share the basketball. They don't seem to have a problem with it. No, we work on that, and we, we talk about that. If we play the way we're capable of playing, and we get everybody involved, everybody can get their points. I mean, it's a 32-minute ball game, the way we run the floor, that there's no reason why we can't get enough shots for everybody the way we play the game. The other thing that's impressive is with all the offensive capabilities you guys have, they really play hard on the defensive end. Yes, uh, we play man-to-man -man pressure, zone pressure. We try to extend the floor to 94 feet, both offensively and defensively. I know talking to you before the game, you were kind of concerned coming up here to Cedar Crest to, to play this Falcon team that's in the thick of the playoff race as well. What was the difference early on when you guys went on that big run to put it away? Well, we told the kids that when we came up here that we knew that they would be ready for us and we'd have to be ready for them. And what we wanted to try to do was take Carpenter out of the game now. He got in some foul trouble, so that hurt them a little bit. But we were trying to deny him the ball and trying to put as much pressure on Hayes because he's been scoring also Kirsch. And I said, if we do those things, we should win the ball game. 
I was kidding during the fourth quarter. I'm going to ask you, where'd you get that sweater? Because I like it. Oh, down in Philly from Boyd's. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's where my next shopping trip is. Congratulations. Very impressive. Best of luck the rest of the way. Thank you. Bob, let's go back to you. Thank you very much. Steve Degler, and again, congratulations to the Red Tornado of McCaskey High School as they clinch the Section 1 title, and they certainly will be the team to be beaten, not only in the Lancaster 11 League, but District 3 playoffs as well. The final score again, McCaskey 81, Cedarcrest 57. We'll come back to the cage here at Cedarcrest High School and wrap it up after this on AT&T. Welcome back to Cedarcrest High School, where the McCaskey Red Tornado just too much tonight for Cedarcrest. The final score, the Red Tornado 81, Cedarcrest 57. And Steve, if there's a knock on this McCaskey basketball team, people trying to find something that you can <laughs> criticize them over, they'll say that the fact is they don't really have a deep bench. And the reality of it is with the five players they put out in the starting lineup, they don't really need much of a bench. No, they don't. They are so impressive at both ends of the floor. And they come out here tonight, they shoot 55% from the floor. You're going to be hard-pressed to beat a team that shoots 55% against you. And they get the easy baskets at a transition. They have Jerry Johnson, who's just an incredible jump shooter. He doesn't miss a whole lot from the field. And he is very deadly defensively. Patterson and Salisbury in the defensive end. We saw the high wire act of Everhart in Salisbury tonight. I don't know if you can find a weakness. You can say Section 1 is down a little bit this year. They don't have the dog fights that they did. That's because McCaskey's so good. That's why Section 1 is down. Everybody else is just trying to fight to stay alive for the playoff battle. As I was saying to you in the break, this is one of the best high school basketball teams I have seen in a long, long time. And again, not to overemphasize this point, but it is something that has to be said. The key word in that is team. They are a solid basketball team with all the components that you need. They do have an inside game when they need to, obviously with the outstanding leaping ability, but Patterson at six foot five and a, and a, and a solid 225 pounds. Salisbury's frail at six foot three, but he can jump out of the gym. So they are obviously a presence on the board and you don't get a whole lot of second and third shot opportunities. No, you don't. And they, they control the rebounds. They can get offensive rebounds themselves. They can score out of a half court set. They can score in transition. I would imagine they're very deadly against his own defense, the way Johnson can shoot jump shots. They've got some other guys with three-point capability. And for Cedar Crest, you know, you really can't be devastated by this loss. You can be disappointed. You can be upset with the way you played, but it's not their season. Nobody expected them to win. McCaskey is figured to run the table and go 14-0 in Section 1. What they have to do now is just not worry about this. It's over with. Everybody else is going to lose to them as well, so they're not going to lose any ground in the standings. They have to take care of themselves the last three games of section play. If they go 3-0 and and win out, they will make the Lancaster Lebanon League playoffs. And that really is going to be the key, the key that certainly that the coaching staff at Cedarcrest is going to concentrate on right now. All right, this one is behind us. Nobody in the, uh, in the race for the section one t playoff spot is going to beat McCaskey, so now we've got to take care of our own business. And I would think that this team that seems to rise to challenges for to, to to some degree, should be able to rise to the challenge of the fact that they came out and laid an egg the last time they played Warwick, and that's who they have coming up next. That, you would think, should get the blood pressure a little bit going for this group of Falcon players. That's a game we had here in at and Broadband uh, back early in the month, and I don't, I don't want to say they were terrible, but they were as close to terrible as you can get without actually being called that, and Rick Dissinger said it was really a turning point. High school teams sometimes have a tendency to look too far ahead. He said oh, his kids look back to that game, and they use that as a focal point. They were at Selang at halftime. Not a good performance in the first 16 minutes. And all the kids, not the coaches, the kids said, hey, we got a second chance even though we played terrible against Warwick. We may not get a third chance. We have to go out there in the second half tonight and win this game. And they found a way to come home victorious. Well, they've got to do the same thing now Friday going to Warwick. They're not going to get another chance. If they go 9-5 and five with three straight wins to close section play, they'll be in pretty good shape. We'll remind you of our next game coming up here on AT&T Broadband. It'll be Friday night. It'll be at Anvil Cleona High School. Section 3 matchup in the boys Lancaster 11 league between the Elko Raiders and Anvil Cleona. We'll have that game coming to you live on channel 23 in Lebanon, channel 8 and 42 in Lancaster County Friday night from Anvil. Again, the final score tonight, McCaskey beats Cedarcrest by a score of final score of 81-57. The Falcons now 11 and 9 overall and 6 and 5 in section 1. McCaskey at 19 and 1 overall and they, they clinched the section 1 title with an 11 and 0 record. The score again, 81-57. McCaskey beats Cedarcrest. From all of us here at AT&T Broadband, our director, Drexel Wright, our stat man, Jeff Zimmerman, my colleague, Steve Deckler, my name is Bob McCool. We thank you for watching, everyone, and have yourselves a great night.